If we felt that grad school really was a dead-end street, we would probably call this goodbye PhD. There'd be a one-episode <laughs> podcast like, hey guys, rethink this. Level can catapult your career. And even if you don't become a data scientist, you will look at problems differently. Welcome to Hello PhD, a podcast for scientists and the people who love them. This week, we learn about a training boot camp that turns bench scientists into data scientists. Stay with us. And we're back. This is Hello PhD, episode 81. I'm Joshua Hall. And I'm Daniel Arneman. And we'll discuss the human side of science and life in the lab. Happy October, Dan. Happy October, Josh. It's uh, starting to cool off. It's getting dark much earlier. I think I just noticed it now. I don't know why. Hey, I'm loving this. Every morning I walk outside and the air has that crisp, cool feeling to it. And Not the man, humid, disgusting feeling yeah. that it normally has. Uh, it's still pretty warm, though. It gets pretty warm. It's hard hard to figure out how to dress your, your kids in the morning because it's like 50, but the high is 85, so it's kind of weird. Layers, and you should just plan to lose all the top layers because they'll throw them off on the playground and you'll never see them again. That's pretty true. Hey, Dan, along the lines of fall, we are kicking off our IPA free fall. Hooray! <laughs> <laughs> I'm, glad, I'm glad you made it back this week. I wasn't sure yeah. if you were going to show up. Uh, but I think you'll like this one, Dan. Uh, so we're going to kick off our first episode of October with an Oktoberfest beer. The origin is October Festival, I assume. I'm guessing so. I didn't look that up. but We should probably find out, yeah. So this one's fun. I, I've been sipping it, and it starts out in a, a totally non-hoppy way. And, and you know, it's, it's got almost a, a little bit of a citrusy flavor, and it's really crisp, really clean. But then, if you wait a minute, you will feel that bitterness on the back of your tongue. So it does kind of sneak up on you. I am I approve of this particular Oktoberfest. Yeah, and, the, and I should mention, too, actually, which Oktoberfest beer we're drinking. Uh, this is Oktoberfest from Bell's Brewery in Comstock, Michigan. So big Bell's fan. I think we've had the two-hearted on the show before. That's one of your favorites. Yeah, and I knew Bells knows what they're doing, so I was overwhelmed by the number of Oktoberfest beers to choose from at the beer store, but I thought, you know, I trust Bells. I bet they put forth a good Oktoberfest. I like it. Do you like it? I do like it. I mentioned last week I had an Oktoberfest at the beer store, and it was very pleasant. It has this kind of malty character um, that I don't always like, but it's malty without being too sweet. So, I mean, to me, an Oktoberfest... It, very easy drinking for sitting out on the back deck on a crisp fall night or sitting at the desk in your podcast studio while you're uh, recording a show. There it is. Perfect. Dan, I've got some more good news for you. We have two new Patreon supporters. Let's hear their names. We'd like to give a special thanks to Sarah and Agnes for their generous support. Thank you so much. Let's go ahead and raise a glass to them. Thank you, Sarah and Agnes. We very much appreciate it. And if you'd like to support the show, you can go to patreon.com slash hellophd, or you can click the Become a Patron button on our website, hellophd.com. Dan, I'm going to keep the good times rolling. We also got a new iTunes review that came in. Oh, you check for those all the time. I love it. You know, they claim, when I say they claim, <laughs> they, <laughs> they, the man, <laughs> the powers that be, this is going to go well with our, our science and news in a minute. Most podcasts I listen to, everyone always says, uh, leave us an iTunes review. It helps new listeners find this show. Have you heard this before? I hear it all the time, yep. Uh, I don't actually know what that means or if that's true. But other podcasts say it, therefore we say it. So we should I, probably, uh, as as scientists, I feel like we need to go check the sources on know, this. I think I'm going to revise my statement. And from now on, I'm going to say, leave us an iTunes review because... We it, really like to hear. It makes Josh smile. It, <laughs> it makes does. me smile. Yeah. We really like to get the feedback, and we love hearing from our listeners. It makes us really happy. So leave an iTunes review because it will make our day. How about that? We also get a lot of great mail. Um, we try to respond to everyone. Sometimes it takes a little while to to be able to get through all of those. If you emailed us and you didn't hear back, let me know so that I can make sure we get that reply out to you. But we do get quite a bit of email, and it's awesome to get that feedback. Yeah, and just to lift the lift the curtain. I'm the social media guy around here, and Dan is the email guy, so... We should tell you which of us is... <laughs> you'll see tweets, you may or may not see emails, but I'm working on it. Yeah, we've got some good topics coming up based on some listener emails, so so be on the lookout for those. Anyway, the, we have a new iTunes review, as I mentioned. This is from... I'm, I hope I'm saying this right. C-U-R-U-Cat. 
How would you say that? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Capital C, though. <laughs> okay. Curacat. Perfect. All right, I'm going to read it now. How about that? Great idea. Okay. I haven't heard this one yet. I'm excited. Yeah, you're hearing this for the first time with our listeners. So the title is, So Grateful to Josh and Dan, I rely on a lot of podcasts to get me through long hours in the lab and clicking in Excel. But when I first saw this podcast, I thought, good grief, I'd rather listen to a podcast about anything else, even sports ball, to distract me from my day-to-day grad school reality. This sounds like you, Dan. Do you think I wrote this? I Do you think, think my, you... my alter ego is cur you cat? <laughs> it could be. Uh, I did say a cat is your spirit animal. So maybe you know how it's not me? You. I wouldn't be clicking in Excel. That's the giveaway. That's true. You would think of some programming thing to do. There you go. But I'm so glad the desperation of having listened to all my main podcasts led me to try an episode. Now I just hope Josh and Dan don't ever stop making it, or at least not until I graduate, please. It's the perfect medicine for the grad student spirit, honoring the struggle that is grad school while inspiring something that feels like real hope for the future. Wow, thanks for that. That's awesome. Yeah, we actually do believe there is hope for the future, and we're glad that that comes across. Uh, you know, if you listen to last the last episode we did, these postdocs that got out of being postdocs, now they're doing a wild variety of things, and they all seem pretty happy. So there is good stuff coming up. Yeah, I would actually say if we felt that grad school really was a dead-end street, we would probably call this Goodbye PhD. There'd be a one-episode <laughs> podcast like, hey, guys, rethink this. Get out. All right, Dan, are you ready for some science in the news? Let's hear it. Dan, are you familiar with PolitiFact? I am familiar with it. This is the fact-checking organization for things that politicians say. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. So PolitiFact won the Pulitzer Prize for national reporting in 2009 following their work during the 2008 presidential election in the United States. And so it was started by... Or it's run by the the Tampa Bay Times, and and it's just what you said, Dan. They fact check uh, mostly statements by members of Congress, the White House, lobbyist interest groups, things related to uh, United States politics. They're very busy these days. Yeah, but you know, there's so much information out there that it can be really hard to wade through what's true, what's not, was this well-referenced, was this well-sourced. I think especially as a scientist, that's something that we're trained to do, even as we read news articles. I know I often get frustrated. A claim will be made, and I thought, like, well, where do you get that from? Well, and beyond that, it's like there's one piece of the thing that they said that's true, but they left out this huge context that would totally change the conclusion. Absolutely. And so besides politics, the... Uh, the other topic that I've found is most clouded in in confusion and contradiction is parenting. I have to agree with you. When I was a first-time parent, I had all these expectations about how things should be, and then reality struck. And I had all these questions, and I didn't know whether I was making the right choices. Is that what you're talking about? These are the yeah, absolutely. And and you probably know this, Dan. Uh, I'll use I'll use getting your child to sleep as an example. So let's say you have the very common experience of you bring your newborn baby home from the hospital, and what do they do? They sleep soundly through the night. I've heard people say that. There are people out there who win the baby lottery, and that is true for them, but that was not my experience. Yeah, most do not. So, so what do you do? You're, what, would, what would any scientist do when you're trying to get your kid to sleep through the night? You go online, you do some research. How do I get my baby to sleep through the night, and what do you find? you find 50% of, of websites that say, you should let your baby cry it out and they will eventually learn to put themselves to sleep. And the other 50% say, letting your baby cry it out will lead to permanent scarring for the rest of their life. You should keep them in your bed and hold them close. Until they're 18. Yeah, yeah. I, I, this is one of my favorite party games, which is go up to a, a, any group of people that is more than two that have kids and say, yeah, I think uh, cry it out is really the way to go. Or the opposite, like, I think attachment parenting is really the way to go. And you will start a fight no matter what, because people are so wed to their notion of how to raise kids. Absolutely. And the sleep thing is just one component out of hundreds of things parents try to figure out. Bring me back to PolitiFact, Josh. This is not a political fact. Well, I wanted to introduce you to a relatively new website called Parentifact. That sounds like a play on words. It is. So this is, instead of PolitiFact, it's parent I fact. <laughs> Why are there so many words that are hard to pronounce today? Parentifact. 
And what this is, Dan, is this is a website inspired by PolitiFact, started by these two journalists that became parents for the first time, and they were frustrated by many of the same things we just talked about. And in their words, that's why they started the site. They asked themselves, why is it so hard, even with the internet, to get clear answers to basic parenting questions? And so they created this website, and, and they have three main tenets that I think parents as scientists would certainly value. The first one is less is more, so they try to get straight to the point. And if you look at some of these at this website, Dan, a lot of these articles are in the form of a, a question, like, should I give my child a daily probiotic? Should I bank my baby's cord blood? What food should I avoid feeding my baby before 12 months? Is it safe to drink alcohol when breastfeeding? Yeah, I, and I'm looking at this website. This is absolutely amazing. So those questions that you answered, if you put your mouse over them, it tells you the answer. So should I give my child a daily probiotic supplement? You put your mouse on it and the answer pops up. No, Unless your child is experiencing diarrhea, eczema, colic, or is an, on antibiotics. And then you can click through to get the full article. And I think they've got quite a bit more information there, including the websites they referenced. I love this one. What bug sprays are safe and best for kids? I recently had another parent come over and we have some bug spray outside. And she's like, oh, DEET? Do you have anything without DEET? I was like, I didn't know I was supposed to be afraid of DEET. I thought DEET was the thing that kept bugs away. And uh, this website now agrees with me. So besides trying to boil down the, the answer to these complicated questions into a consensus, if there is one, there are other two tenets. The first one is nothing's finished. And I really love this. So they say, no article on this site is ever done. That's a relic of print publishing. As we find new evidence or recommendations change, we'll constantly go back and improve what we published before. So these are going to constantly be updated. And I think this is super great. And then the last is we don't know everything. We're new parents too. We don't pretend to be doctors. Information we provide here won't be our opinions. It's all sourced from legitimate places, which we will cite in detail. Like, how great is that? If you're not sure about what they have to say, there are links so you can go back and, and see for yourself. They seem very approachable, and they seem like they're trying to do the right thing. I have no doubt that out of the three different questions or five different questions we just mentioned, somebody listening will say, that's the worst advice I've ever heard. I, I don't think you can remove the passion that people have about taking care of their kids, but uh, I will probably come back here when I have a parenting question. Yeah, I think this is certainly a welcome resource, especially for scientists who really like to uh, find evidence for, for the decisions we make. So just wanted to share that. Thanks, Josh. You're just four years too late. All right, Dan, are you ready for our topic? Let's do it. All right, Josh. This week, we have a topic that is of particular interest to me. You'll remember a few episodes ago, probably quite a few episodes ago, we had a science in the news where uh, scientists were using machine learning algorithms to classify and help predict heart attack outcomes. Do you remember that episode? I do. And we got lots of feedback because we made some statements that were apparently truth adjacent, but not exactly on full truth scale. We were, we were fact checked we by were, our we listening audience. We were a little fact checked. Which exactly. is great. Yeah. So, but based on that amount of interest, we thought, well, wouldn't it be cool to talk to somebody who is using machine learning, who's doing data science uh, in their everyday work? So we actually got in touch with Joel Schwartz, and he is uh, fulfilling two different roles right now. He's the CEO of Schwozny Incorporated. And he'll talk a little bit about that in this interview, but he's also teaching at the Level Bootcamp, which is a data science training experience at Northeastern University. And we thought that he'd be a great person to talk to because he is a PhD scientist who is now applying uh, some of his biological knowledge, but combining that with data analysis and computer programming in some really cool new fields that uh, were difficult to address without computers. Yeah, and also helping bench scientists gain access to those skills. That's right. So if any of this sounds interesting to you, there are pathways now for you as a bench scientist to acquire some of these skills and, and really expand your toolbox uh, and the types of questions you can answer. All right, let's take a listen. Hi, uh, my name is Joel Schwartz. I am currently an instructor of data analytics with the Level Program at Northeastern. I'm also the CEO of Schwozny Analytics, and my major role is to develop analytical tools for biomedical data analysis. Uh, recently, I had a very wonderful experience. My five-year-old daughter, Michaela, 
I came into her class to teach science, and I got the best experience of trying to figure out what it is that I do. So the teacher actually asked her, they said, Michaela, do you want to tell your dad, tell everyone what your daddy does? So she stood up proud as punch and she looks right at everybody in the class and she goes, my daddy makes rack brains glow in the dark. <laughs> <laughs> that, that is probably true, right? That's... And that is, and what was amazing to me, and I realized very quickly, um, it's basically the most impressive thing she saw was when I showed her pictures of the fluorescent images that we were evaluating for uh, gene expression, right? She's yeah. looking for GFP and she's like, wow, dad, you have glowing brains. Yeah, the NIH has to be convinced a little further that this is important, but to a, a classroom of, of little kids, this is amazing just by itself, right? It, it, it was truly amazing to her. And I, I did look at her. I said, honey, you know that's not all I do. She goes, I know, Dad, but telling everybody that you pound keys on a keyboard and hit send is not terribly exciting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but she's right. I mean, a lot of what I'm doing now is uh, based on how to leverage and build uh, analysis programs. Right. So I'm often writing computer code to help advance questions. And uh, what I'd like to say is I'm kind of a data explorer. Right. I'm trying to ask those questions that, you know, people didn't even realize were questions in the first place. Now, your background, Joel, is is bench science. Am I right? Yeah. I mean, I grew up on the bench. Um, I started, you know, way back at Virginia Tech. I remember my uh, very first time I was on the bench trying to do my first analytical titration and messing it up terribly. Uh, still, still don't quite get those titrations correct. But yeah, I grew up on the bench. My background um, in terms of education is all biology, right? I've actually only taken one computer course uh, one formal computer course in my career. So how did you make that transition from bench scientist, biologist to now computer scientist, data scientist? Oh, well, uh, very fortunately, my mom, years ago, when I was about eight years old, decided that she wasn't going to buy me a Nintendo. She bought me a computer and said, make the games yourself. So I did. So I've been a hobbyist for computers for a very long time. I've been, you know, fluent in learning how to write computer programs. I just never had the formality of a, you know, well-defined course. And actually, when I was on the bench and my first uh, set of experiments in graduate school was to develop a new fluorescence-based assay to understand neurotransmitter transport systems. Well, at that time, right now I'm really dating myself and earning my gray hair, uh, they didn't have software that could possibly analyze what turned out to be me circling over 10 million cells. I actually <laughs> oh, counted this sounds it up. so familiar, yeah. Uh, in, my, in my PhD thesis, I counted it up, right? I actually totaled, I circled over 10 million cells by hand. Um, and at that time, try to put that one in Excel, it wasn't going to happen. Not a chance. In fact, it's not going to get into Excel now. So just to clarify, so I'm, I'm more of a biologist too. Microbiology is my background. So, so I hear the term data science a lot. And what exactly does that mean? So in, in your words, you know, what would you say data science is and what is it not? Yeah, and it's, it's funny. It's a loaded question where I think if you put um, – you know, 10 data scientists in a room, you're going to get 10 different answers. Because I worked at a bench and I had data. Also, yep. You're a scientist. <laughs> we all have data. I'm a scientist. You're a data oh. scientist. Well, right. Uh, one of the things about a data scientist, and it's often another comparative you may hear is a data analyst, right? So what's the difference between a data scientist and a data analyst? Um, I often make the analogy that a data analyst is a little bit more like a tour guide, right? They have a set grouping of data. They have a set group of processes by which they will then try to extract some information and help you tour through the data. So they're really good at helping you answer that question. For those of you guys on the bench, this is very akin to, I ran a BCA assay, right? I fit my data to a linear model and I could calculate what the coefficient was. So now I can predict what my protein concentration is. What a data scientist is going to do is help understand and bring to light and try to find out information about what the research is about. 
And I guess a simple way that I often put it is that a data scientist is going to help you answer questions that you didn't know were questions. So they get into the data, they start to look at trends like an analyst would, but then they're also now going to pose questions. They're also going to start to say, well, what if you did it this way? What if we looked at it from this perspective? A data scientist is someone who will say, well, if you collect the following pieces of data, we can add information to a predictive model, for example. So actually, the last thing you said maybe made me realize I wasn't um, totally right on this. So what I was going to ask you was it seems like, especially with genetics, there are, there's all this data that's been collected, these huge data sets. So are data scientists really... They're looking out there and saying, wow, look at all this data that's just sitting there, almost like un, like uninhabited wilderness. Let's go out there and see what the interesting questions are, what's hiding in there. Or do data scientists say, you know what, it would be really great if we had, had these data, then we could really ask some cool questions. Is it more one or the other or kind of both? Well, you know, the answer is always going to be kind of both. Um, but... What I would say is, what an inter- I saw a very interesting, I was reading an article the other day, I saw a really interesting fact. 90% of the data that is presently found in the ecosystem of data was collected within the last two years. But when they're talking about data, they're talking about information that is collected, for example, every time you run a credit card at Walmart. Right. So data itself, the ability to now store data has allowed us to collect a lot more information. Uh, Another way to think about this from your genetics analogy is, hey, the ability to sequence the human genome, which was a major accomplishment, is now being done, I think, what we have, $1,000 genomes. You can sequence a genome for 1000 bucks, and you know it can be done in significantly less time. So the ability to collect information is going through the roof. I guess that my, my background is often in microscopy and many devices now exist that are like slide scanners and automated microscopes. So the ability to collect a ton of images, technical term there, really a ton of images, is very easy. It's real easy to go into the bench today, set up a microscope and collect 20,000 images for one overnight experiment. It can be done, no problem. The question is now, what do you do with it? Yeah, this seems like a, a real shift in, in, in the way science is done. So before I had to have an idea, I set up my replicates, I did the experiment, and I analyzed those 30 data points, whatever it was. Now, I can collect data that I don't even want. Uh, and it's possible that there's value in it if I'm willing to go explore and use that word explorer. And, and so now there are machines collecting data for me. And I have to be the person to go make sense of it. But it's too big for me to uh, approach in a planned, I want to say a planned way. Like I had, I had thought of this idea at first, but now I got to go through and find out what it can tell me. Well, it's, it, you are. I, I would absolutely agree with what you're saying. There's um, traditionally science always approach things from a reductionist perspective, right? I'm going to limit and test my one variable and compare it to my one variable. That was done for two reasons. One, you only had so much time in the day, right? You could only run so many titrations. You could only run so many gels. But with the advent of the ability to automate a lot of these laboratory processes, um, it becomes significantly easier to collect huge amounts of information. And again, this is where your data scientist comes in, right? They're often not taking the reductionist approach. They're taking a more holistic approach. What if I look at every variable? It's interesting, especially when you start thinking about moving this towards clinical science, where some of the biomarkers that we have identified that are very potent biomarkers for predicting effectiveness in treatments of disease were biomarkers that we found because we had the data column there, or we had it because you know we collected all the information. Uh, One of the examples I often use is that measuring effective treatments in Parkinson's disease can often be done by understanding eye blink. Eye blink? I'm I'm staring at Josh right now just to check, just to watch his number of blinks. You know, it's funny with all, all, uh, I think Apple 
has ruined this because when you first said I blink, I was <laughs> you, you I was imagining it the other way, yeah. lowercase I with a blink. Yeah, I blink. No, uh, no <laughs> trademark. Yeah, <laughs> you mean blinking of the well, eyes? I often, it's funny because yes, blinking of the eyes. How often someone is blinking the eyes? Um, it turns out that's a very well correlated uh, function to relate to how your dopaminergic systems are working inside your brain. And thus, if you are Parkinsonian, you will have a remarkably different eye blink. Now, that's one of those things that we were able to identify because of the fact that we were collecting all sorts of information. No one went looking for the linkage between eye blink and dopamine levels. It, it just happened they collected both, and it turns out they correlated. Well, if you think about the clinical space, especially now if for those guys who are thinking, you know, I'm on the bench, I can measure dopamine levels in a mouse by going in and doing, for example, microdialysis. Uh, it's typically frowned upon to do microdialysis in a patient uh, if you don't have to. Right. So a lot of times by collecting such large bodies of information, we may be finding biomarkers that are correlates that I don't think people have a problem if you're blinking too much, but they definitely want to solve problems if you've got Parkinson's disease. So here it's just a great correlate. And it's really derived from the fact that we are collecting massive amounts of data. So, so Joel, I was going to I was going to say, you know, I work. Um, I work at UNC Chapel Hill with a lot of our trainees, and so I hear about a lot of the research they're doing, a lot of the research that um, different labs and different departments are doing. And and what I've observed over the, the past, uh, definitely the last five years, it seems like it used to be there were the few labs who were in the computational biology program who were doing this type of data science and you walked in their lab and there were people on computers um, more so than at the bench. But it seems like these days, as you mentioned with the growth, the explosion in automated data collection, that now the need for data scientists has really expanded um, into labs that were or research groups that were traditionally bench research groups. And it seems like there's a lot of interest in uh, those investigators bringing people into their group who have the skills to actually mine these data and look for these questions. But one thing I've also seen is with our trainees, though, there's almost a shortage of people who have the interest in the biology, but the know-how to do the computer science. Is that something you've observed? Absolutely. And it's really interesting because um, this is actually pervasive, not only in science, um, but across multiple disciplines that are using data science. Uh, we see this in the financial industry. Procurement has their own finance or data analysts or data science groups. Um, logistics has their own data science and data analyst groups because what we've discovered is that the acumen associated with understanding the problem is a very key aspect for the success of a data scientist. So what we're noting is that if I'm a lab, Right? and I am working on a really interesting problem in gene therapy, it is now possible for me to derive, and in fact, this a colleague of mine at UNC, a gentleman named Steve Gray. Steve, as then you know, is doing brilliant work in understanding the evolution of gene therapy vectors, where he can be generating millions of gene therapy vectors in one experiment and evaluating all sorts of different pieces. But understanding how to then interpret that data from a data science perspective, the person who sits in Steve's lab and has that direct communication to understand capsid evolution will provide better analysis. So what you're noting is, or at least what I'm seeing, is uh, labs no longer have dry versus wet or computational versus bench. And I think you're seeing that the best data scientists are the ones that sit on the bench with the person generating the uh, wet bench data themselves. So it sounds like, and, and I've, I've told students this as well, they're thinking about from a career perspective, you know, so we think about the audience of this podcast, it's predominantly science trainees, postdocs, graduate students, some undergraduates. So it seems like the career perspectives for someone who, um, has no matter what their interests are, but develops or cultivates a background in computer science, 
really has a very bright career future ahead of them if if that's the route they go in. Is that true? Yeah, and I mean, we've seen studies, and uh, and it's funny, we've done studies ourselves, because the level program at Northeastern is designed on to how to help people develop those, you know, computational skills to take back to their, you know, everyday lives in the bench, for example. So let's explore that. Tell us, tell us a little bit, what is the level program? Because I think it's the first time we've mentioned it. Okay, so uh, that's the main program that I'm an instructor with. And the level program is a, uh, we have two different varieties, one of which is a full-time program where you go eight weeks straight nine to five. And effectively, what we're doing is giving you a whole new tool set. So most of our trainees come in, oh, they know a little bit about Excel. They might know, like you said, I'm a scientist. I've, I've worked with data. And what we're training them on is now advanced tools such as R programming, uh, SQL databasing, Tableau deep visualization. And what I often say to the students is, after these eight weeks of training, you will look at problems differently. You will fundamentally look at problems differently. You won't have a fear of the, oh my God, I've got 10,000 files, because you're going to think, hey, I'm just going to write a computer program, small little computer program, and I'm going to crunch through that data very, very quickly. So the the fear, I mean, I've seen the look on people's faces when all they can think about is, okay, if I have 10,000 files, I have to open 10,000 files in Excel and copy and paste into new tabs. I believe there's this massive like deer in the headlights look of fear that they get on there, you know, very quickly like, ah, no, no, please don't make me do this. Please don't make me do this. Uh, whereas someone who knows our programming is going to say, eh, here's my six lines of code. And I combined all that file, all those files into one analysis. So this program, is this available? This is for Northeastern graduate students? No, actually, it's an available program um, for, we're part of the business and professional studies program. So it is a uh, something you can apply to as an individual. You do not have to be a student at Northeastern. Anybody can apply. We have two different varieties, actually three different varieties, really. The full-time, and that's where, you know what, you're going to go eight weeks and you're going to get it done. We have a mixture, which is an online and in-person course we call hybrid, same material, but just spread out over a longer period. Right, because let's face reality, uh, everybody's got lives, <laughs> and it's really hard to take you know eight weeks off straight. So this is much more like a night course, and then we also have a variety which is completely online. So what are the what are the prerequisites for for joining this course? So we actually have an application process where we ask you information about your experience in statistics in Excel, and you know just your general comfort level with data. So most people who are a bench scientist will qualify for the course. Two questions, I guess. One, how long has this course been going on? And two, what do individuals who complete the course typically go on to do? We are, uh, Level has been, we're coming up to our two-year anniversary. We've graduated approximately 300 students. Uh, We run multiple courses per year. So we're running full-time three or three to four times a year, depending upon need. And we're running hybrid at this point. We launch a new hybrid group every month. So there's a huge, I mean, we can fill the classroom, which is telling us there's a pretty big demand for people to try to garner these skills. And are these mostly scientists that enroll? And it's actually a combination, right? We've got many people who are coming from the financial sector. I've got people who are e-commerce. I've got sociology majors. I've got psychology majors and ample people who are coming in from a science perspective. So we do tailor the course, right? We change up the um, examples and how we do things based on the students' needs and the students' demographics. So if I have 15 lab bench scientists in a classroom, well, guess what? All my examples start to become lab bench examples. What's really, I think, what attracted me to this course and what made me say, I want to teach at level was at the end of the course, we have something called a capstone project. A capstone project is where you will go work with a company. So let's say you're a bench scientist. You know, you say academics is not for me. I get into level. I work with Joel. I develop these new skills. Then what Northeastern, through our Northeastern experiential network, we're going to go find a company that works well 
for your needs. We batch your needs and what you want to do. And we actually have you go into that company for two weeks and analyze data, a real unequivocal data problem. Now, up here in Boston, I can tell you that we have a very large number of pharmaceuticals, contract research organizations. So the ability for you to kind of dip your toe into that um, industrial sector becomes an easy gateway for a level student. Yeah, this sounds really, really amazing. You know, I would imagine that some of our listeners who are PhD students and postdocs are probably listening to you describe this and thinking, wow, this is something that I'm really interested in, in looking into. If you're, if you're a science trainee specifically, when would, be, when would be the right time to do this? When would be the optimal time a student or postdoc who's interested in this level experience? Oh, is I it, have an answer for that question. Is it, I, I'm having a hard time thinking they could go to their PI and say, hey, I'm going to take a little eight-week hiatus and go do this program. But maybe so. Yeah, I don't but, know. But that being said, don't wait to do it, right? You're, you're crunching through data for five, six years in your PhD. Don't wait until you're a sixth year. That's not the time to, to do this. I... Uh, so, I mean, that's you hit on a very important question where it really depends on the individual. It depends on the PI, right? So, there the PI is always going to say no. So it, no, maybe it depends on the individual. No, no you don't no, think so? Because here's 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 what I would say, right? Because I've I've had a position where I've had my own lab. I've been the guy that you know would normally have said no. <laughs> um, if a student had come up to me and said, "Hey, I think." I can get my work done a hundred times faster. I can make it way cheaper because now you're not going to have to go pay for a developer or a you know advanced computer programmer. But I need eight weeks to go look at my data with these advanced data scientists up in Boston. And I'll come back with a whole new set of tools. Now, what do you think the PI might say? So if you present it and think about it as an opportunity where you know, I'm going to, I know you're taking a respite. You might be taking a little bit of a break between when you can generate data on the bench, but especially for those new PhD students that may have just kind of finished up classes and they're ready to transition into that full-time research perspective. To me, that's an ideal time to come take the level course. This is really awesome. I know we're going to have a lot of our listeners interested in this, so we will make sure we post the info about the level program with website with the links in our show notes. Before, I guess I'll, I'll leave it here. Is there anything else you want to say about the level program? Because um, I want to pivot just a little bit and let you talk a little bit about. I know Dan mentioned to me you are asking some really cool questions and and breaking some new ground. And we'd like to give you a little bit of time to talk about those things. So, anything else you want to say about the level program to our listeners? Yeah, and I just I I. Actually, I can kind of dovetail those two questions for you, right? I can tell you in very uh, frank honesty, I wish I had a level program six years ago, right? Because I second I, that. I went through a really tough transition where I was, as you said, I'm going from being a bench scientist to doing a lot of this computational work. And I had to learn most of my stuff through Google, uh, online courses, uh, various strategies that were you know, eventually effective, but what I did in two years of painstaking Googling uh, could have been done in that eight weeks. So for me, I would just leave you with the fact that I very earnestly believe that level uh, can catapult your career. And even if you don't become a data scientist, you will look at problems differently. And the one of the reasons I find level in particular to be a very useful program is that our instructors are all practicing data scientists, right? I'm not, you know, I guess I'm not just an instructor. Uh, I also have my company in which we are developing new tools. In particular, one of the tools I'm really excited about that we're currently working on is with a, a collaborator, behavioral imaging. Behavioral Imaging and Schwozny Analytics are working together to create new tools for the ability to augment the treatment in autism. As you may be aware, uh, autistic patients are often needed to be diagnosed on a regular basis to see their continued progression during the developmental uh, processes. For those of you familiar with autistic patients, asking an autistic patient to go into a doctor's office is really hard. It's really hard on the patient. 
These guys are extremely sensitive to their environment. And what are you doing? You're asking them to go into a completely odd environment, all sorts of different new sounds, all different new sensations. I mean, I can't imagine asking to some, asking an autistic patient to do something more excruciating than that. So behavioral imaging has developed a wonderful system that allows parents to videotape children in their natural environment, where they're happy, where they feel comfortable. Where we come in in the data analytics that we're providing is that we take the videos that behavioral imaging is collecting. Behavioral imaging has done some amazing work where they've had clinicians annotate the videos. In other words, they go through, they watch the video, and they say, oh, there's an autistic behavior. Okay, here's an autistic behavior. What my company is now doing is we're developing the tools to develop mathematical models using something called deep learning, which is a you know wonderful tool, wonderful term to really impress people, right? All deep learning is is a very fancy machine learning method that allows us to train a computer to watch a video and say, hey, that was an autistic behavior. That was an autistic behavior. That's so cool because when you were describing the clinicians going in and watching the videos, I was like, oh, too bad you can't train a computer to do that <laughs> and automate that. And you, we you are. are. <laughs> we are. But I, I want to be very clear because our goal is never to replace the clinician. Uh, I think there it plays a vital role because I want to develop tools that augment their work. So now imagine you're a clinician and you can sit down and you've got 200 videos to go through. Which would you rather do? Watch a 40-minute video of which there's going to be huge gaps that aren't very interesting or go right to the frames that are really interesting to you. More importantly, you can help track the progress of these uh, patients by this automated process. Now, a clinician is a very limited reagent, right? They're a limited uh, resource. Now, I can go on to Amazon cloud services and buy hundreds and hundreds of computers. So it allows me to process data very, very quickly. So we can often look at these parents and say, you know what? Take a video of your kid every month. Go ahead. And we can crunch it through our system in a matter of hours and quickly send up red flags to the clinician to say, hey, this is a patient you really might want to pay attention to. Well, you're getting a few you're getting a few things out of this, which are really fascinating. We talked earlier about once you have the automated or or um, machine driven method for collecting the data, you will collect more of it. So this clinician who's very expensive, maybe we would have had twenty minutes to see the doctor with the patient, and the patient is out of his normal element, and things have changed, and so you're actually modifying behavior by by doing the assessment. So we've got 20 minutes of kind of modified behavior. Whereas with a, a parent taking a video at home, I assume they could record for 30 minutes, an hour, whatever it takes. They could they could do it at dinner time. They could do it during um, independent play time. You could get different visions of that child and now basically compress that down so that the clinician still spends the same amount of time, but it's a more dense uh, analysis time than they right. had before. Or uh, another thing that I often think about, you can sample more frequently, right? You can, you can check in on this kid every, every two weeks if you want versus if they have to come into the office, now it's every six months at best. The, the number of questions that now come out of this that you can answer because of the, just the simple increase in the frequency that you can make some of these measurements, um, I think will be very probative and helpful uh, if anything, one of the pieces that behavioral imaging is known for is the ability to help parents create coachable moments to uh, augment the behavioral therapy. So, for example, we watch the video, we can fire off to the parents to say during that autistic moment. Yeah, that that is amazing. So, I have I have one one final question, and then we will wrap this up. We don't want to take too much of your time today. But it seems like so many of these advances in technology, whether it's in storage capacity uh, or computing power, have really have really reached a level that was necessary within the last 10 years, certainly, maybe even the last five years. Can you think of any really big questions from medicine or even that we face as a society that have really perplexed us for a long time that you think that deep learning could help us to, to overcome or answer? 
I believe one of the forefronts of how we're going to be more effective in healthcare is the development of personalized medicine, which means we need to start developing therapies in which we are leveraging uh, information about the patient, in which we think about their genetics. Like I said, a thousand dollar genome, that's a lot of information. And I think the forefront of where therapeutics will make their most, um, will become much more effective is when we start to develop tests that can predict which one of these four medications is going to be ideally suited for the patient themselves. Uh, cancer, as you mentioned, you're already starting to see some of this come to light. Uh, in fact, I was recently, I heard a commercial the other day because um, I'm, I've always got my ears out for data science in the kind of the general public. And there was a commercial for a cancer therapeutic in which the woman on the commercial said, but I had the P21 gene and it totally caught my attention. I said, what? Um, it was in the commercial. And she says, and it completely changed the therapy that I did. And I was much more effective. To me, that was just one of the best examples. And I think you're going to start Start to see this become more and more prevalent. And the only way this works is if we can collect and mine enough data to create predictive models that can help us understand what uh, patients are seeing and what's going to happen for that individual patient, right? We've got several different medications that can be used to monitor cholesterol. Now, the real question is, which is the right one for Josh? Which is the right one for Dan? And that's where the only, the only way we're going to understand that is data science. And the only way that that's going to occur, we can build as many machines as you want. We can build the biggest storage capacity. We can have the biggest clouds. But the answer, the bottleneck, will always be creative scientists who can explore that data. So I think the, the role of the data scientist will never be taken away by technology, but only augmented by technology. I think I might sign up for this course. You ought to. I think you'd enjoy it. You know, Dan, one thing that, that I've tried to do in, in my current job working with graduate students is, is you know, I hear conversations uh, among faculty and, and you know, among my, my colleagues as we think about careers for, for PhDs, and there are so many opportunities for individuals who have some of these programming and computational skills um, who are interested in biological questions. But it seems like an issue is that there, there's more need for, for people with those skills than there are people who actually have those skills. And so we've, we've really tried to, to bridge that gap by trying to have these, these short workshops maybe over the summer once a week to try to introduce students to these you know, skills such as computer programming and data science. But it's really something that, that's hard to do in such a short period of time. And so really the hearing about something that's, that's immersive but very concentrated over a, over a number of weeks, I mean, it's really a brilliant idea. I mean, how great of an investment would that be, not just for what you can bring to your current lab, but for your future career than to take part in something like this level program? No, you're so right. The ability to put in a bunch of time at once. But then in my experience, you do have to keep up that skill. It's like using a muscle. Uh, if I go away from a particular, you know, computer programming language for a while, I will totally forget all the conventions and it'll be a really slow process to try and do something in it. Whereas if you are solving problems regularly, um, you really do, it gets to be second nature to just, you know, type out a, a really quick script to maybe process this data. So I think finding a way to incorporate it. And the other thing I would say is even if you, you know, if it turns out you try out some computer programming or you take a, a boot camp like this and it's just not your thing. And I think that's going to be true for some people who they see the power of it, but it's just not for them. I think being aware of the techniques and aware of the fact that you don't have to manually do these processes you may open up a collaboration with somebody who can do this. And you'll be able to explain it to them in a way that crosses that bridge. So I think just being aware that these technologies are out there uh, and being able to converse in this dialect is going to help you out a lot. Yeah, I mean, from my, my personal experience, Dan, when I was doing my own research and I needed to do all of these these 
PubMed searches and and we were chatting about something else and I think I'd mentioned to you what I was currently up to, which was, oh, I need to find authorship information on these 300 grad students and it takes such a long time to type all those in <laughs> PubMed one, one at a time and you were like, you idiot, a computer I, could... <laughs> I never said that phrase. <laughs> you moron. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you were doing it in a coffee shop. At least it was a, a pleasant place to work on it. That I is guess. true. I had a cappuccino close by. Um, but you know, you having you know having the experience of doing scripting in Python, you saved me so much time and actually made and and, and in reality made the study so much better than it ever would have been using a little bit of of computer code. You know, I went to a neuroscience symposium recently, which I don't I don't get to see science talks very much anymore, but. Um, at this symposium, it was about a half a day, and uh, it was on the topic of Alzheimer's, but I saw so many great examples of computer applications for uh, for biologists. So there were people who were predicting Alzheimer's uh, diagnosis based on MRI images, and they could do it um, with pretty good accuracy up to a year before a doctor could figure it out. So, so can we get ahead of these things? And maybe if there are drug treatments, let's apply those early. There were people modeling neuronal connections. They called it the connectome, which is, I think, a pretty cool thing to apply. Um, really amazing 3D imaging stuff that I had never seen before. You know, we had we had immunofluorescence, but it was all two dimensional. And this was, you know, they would have animations in there. Uh, Maybe you've seen some of these. Mm -hmm. um, and even some things of, of doing image processing to, to measure pain relief in mice, which is, you know, it, it's, it's related to this video processing that Joel talked about, but um, so many different applications. And this is just one narrow field, one narrow topic. So I think there's a lot out there. Yeah, it really makes you excited to think what we might be able to to accomplish in, in health and medicine over the next 10 years, the next 20 years. And when you see how quickly things are changing, I remember when I was a graduate student, one of my colleagues down the hall, um, he spent, it wasn't his whole project, but part of his project was trying to identify this one type of mutation, this one mutation in the genome of this bacteria that he was studying to try to figure out what mutation was causing this phenotype. And so he was trying to do all this classical genetics to try to narrow down which part of the genome the mutation was in. And, and he ended up never figuring it out during the five years he was there. However, Right after he graduated, a rotation student came in the lab, and I went to her, her poster presentation at the end of the rotation. She had found the mutation because we had a new genome sequencing facility that opened on campus. They paid $1,500, sequenced the entire genome of that mutant strain, and found the amino acid, or found the, the nucleotide change. Oh, that hurts. <laughs> that like, hurts. In like six weeks. Yeah. <laughs> your, your five years has a, a dollar figure now. It was $1,500. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. But it's cool. It's cool to see how things progress and how things change. That's probably $50 now. Who even knows? You know, I think, Dan, I always felt like I kind of missed out on, on this because, you know, I didn't major in computer science as an undergrad. Uh, and I got into the lab and, you know, I knew skills like molecular biology and some biochemistry. Uh, but it, it always seemed unapproachable, like, well, I couldn't do uh, bioinformatics or I couldn't do computational biology because that's not what my training is in. But it it's really a game changer for me to hear, no, there are things you can do. There are ways you can build those skills and gain those skills um, and really boost your marketability and go in some new directions. Yeah, I'll say that I think there are, are different levels of computer programming, obviously. So there are the people who can write a script to maybe process some files. And then there are people who understand the mathematics of a neural network and are, are making new neural network configurations or new methods for machine learning. And, and there's a whole range in between. I don't, I don't ever think I'll achieve the upper level for somebody who has a, a really solid math background and they're doing this really exploratory new uh, model creation. But Thankfully, those people and, and people like them have created tool sets and have created libraries where I can take some data and say, I want it to, to fit into this type of model, and it'll spit out the answer. So um, you learn a lot enough to tweak some of those things and to, to alter the parameters, but you don't have to be the person that came up with the idea, if that makes sense. Absolutely. If you'd like to learn more about the level program and some of the work Joel um, and his colleagues are doing at Northeastern. We're going to post a link for how you can learn more. And if any of our listeners end up actually doing this program, certainly let us know. We would love to, to hear about your experiences. All right, Dan, what's our word of the week? 
All right, Josh, the clue was pulled from the headlines last week. Though they don't raise their voices in response, they can still be heard over the music. Oh, Not exactly a science word, so mm. it's a tough one. All right, Dan, I've got a guess for this one. Okay, you have a, a news story that involves... I'm going to guess Anthem. Anthem it is. Uh, this is... You know, this is our national anthem. This is a song we sing, but it comes from a word that means a song that's in alternate parts. I don't know if you're familiar with these songs that are kind of call and response. They come from a lot of different cultures over a long period of time where you sing something and then I sing something back. You know how those go? Oh, yeah. I grew up in the church choir. Exactly. Yeah. So so this comes from the Greek antiphona, which is in return, anti, and phone, which is voice. But I thought it was kind of cool. So it's a responsive uh a, a response, an answer in song. I just thought it was interesting that the word anthem means a voice in response. And this was something that the football players were trying to have their voices heard, even though they were uh, kneeling during the anthem. And uh, it's kind of contained right there in the word origin. Very cool, Dan. I did not know that. Okay, Josh, I've got another puzzle for you. And this one is really for you. Oh, good. I'm listening. If there's a nibble on the line, reel it in. You may catch this genus of hook-nosed river fish. One more time. If there's a nibble on the line, reel it in. You may catch this genus of hook-nosed river fish. Remember, I'm looking for a scientific word described by the clue, and once you get it, you'll find that the literal meaning of that science word is a phrase in the clue itself. If you think you know the answer, email it to puzzle at hellophd.com, and we'll randomly select a winner from all the correct responses and send the lucky puzzler an Amazon gift card. I did a lot of fishing in graduate school. I know you did. That's why I think you'll get this one. That was that was totally my stress release. It was in the morning before going into lab. There was a small lake near my townhouse, and you could rent a boat and a trolling motor, and I would go out and be by myself on the lake. We'll find out next week whether you caught this genus of fish. All right, Dan, this has been a great show, a really interesting topic. I learned a lot. However, if you have a topic idea or a question you'd like to hear us discuss on the show, you can email us at podcast at hellophd.com, send us a tweet at hellophd, or leave us a message on our Facebook page. If you like the show, leave us a review on iTunes because it makes us really, really happy. Good answer. If you'd like to support the show, you can become a patron. Simply go to our website, hellophd.com, and click on the Become a Patron button, or you can visit patreon.com slash hellophd, and we would appreciate the beer money. Happy Oktoberfest, Dan. I have enjoyed this. Thank you, Josh. We'll see you next time. See you next time. I hope I'm saying this right. Curu cat? C-U-R-U cat. C C U R U cat. How would you say that? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> C U R U cat. How about that? <laughs> Capital C though. <laughs> okay. Curry cat. Perfect. <laughs>